God's word from the book of John, chapter 10, verses 22 to 30. The time came for the festival of dedication in Jerusalem. It was winter and Jesus was in the temple, walking in the covered porch named for Solomon. The Jewish opposition circled around him and asked, how long will you test our patience? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I have told you, but you don't believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you don't believe because you don't belong to my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. They will never die and no one will snatch them from my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them from my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Holy wisdom, holy word. Well, folks are online, I apologize. It's a, it's a rough hybrid service, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> but if you remember when we started doing Zoom worship, it was rough in the beginning. Give us time. We'll work out all the kinks and, uh, and be able to do this seamlessly. Please join me in a prayer. God, you are our shepherd. You watch us over, watch over us fiercely and lovingly and relentlessly. Open us this day to your word, startle us with your grace and good news, and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart, may it all be acceptable to you, O God, who is our strength and our savior. Amen. 19 years ago, take it down some mark. 19 years ago on Sunday, October the 6th, 2002, I preached my first sermon in this pulpit as your pastor. It was a personal testimony called Confessions of a Former Jesus Freak. I don't think anybody except Beverly was here at that time. I shared my faith story about how a child of the church at First Presbyterian Midland, Texas grew up went off to church camp at Camp Chimney Springs in Mayhill, New Mexico, and became a Jesus freak. It was the early 70s, and I was an impressionable preteen who eventually in high school carried a big King James Bible to school and handed out gospel tracts to the hippies playing Frisbee in the park. My second sermon the following week was a continuation of that personal testimony after all, I was brand new. I wanted the congregation to know their pastor. The second sermon was called Reflections of a Reforming Calvinist. My faith journey continued with a call to ministry in the ninth grade and a journey of both head and heart as a religion major in college and a seminary grad. That teenage Jesus freak grew up and eventually became a Presbyterian pastor. Now, when I graduated from Union Theological Seminary in Richmond, Virginia, I described myself as an obnoxious Calvinist. At the wise age of 28, I thought I had all of the theological answers to life questions because I had been trained to be the resident theologian of a Southern Presbyterian church in the 1950s. Problem was, I graduated in 1984. Well, the pains and problems of life and in my congregation soon showed me that I didn't have all the answers. In fact, I was a lot left with a lot of unanswerable questions. But as I walked with my congregation through heartache and suffering, that once obnoxious Calvinist mellowed 
and learn to rely on God's relentless love. God's relentless love, I think, is the best theological answer I learned in seminary, and it has stuck with me for the past 37 years as a pastor. I believe with all of my heart that God's love is unconditional, unmerited, and unlimited. I believe with all of my heart that God never lets us go no matter what. Even if we let go of God, God does not let go of us. Even if we deny God, God does not deny us. God's love is passionately unrelenting, ferociously and consistent and perfectly stubborn. It's God's love for us cannot be foiled by anything, not even a rejection of God. In our story from John's Gospel, Jesus is tested by some critics in Jerusalem. They challenge him to come out and declare himself the Messiah or not. Reply, his reply is neither yes or no. Jesus has been speaking about his relationship with those who follow in his way. He says he loves them and they share in community. And he describes that relationship with a very timely metaphor, one that everybody in his world understands, a shepherd and his sheep. The sheep and shepherd image was real and poignant and intimate. Ancient shepherds cared for their valuable creatures and vulnerable creatures in loving and fiercely protective ways. Jesus says that's how he relates to his community, to us, to each of you, and to me. In this passage, Jesus says, they hear my voice, I know them. And then to get his point across, he says, no one will snatch them from my hand. And then he repeats that important message, no one will snatch them from my father's hand. To me, this sheep and shepherd language is a great metaphor for God's relentless love. It says God never lets go of us, even if we let go of God. God does not let go of us. God's love is passionately unrelenting, ferociously insistent, and perfectly stubborn. God's love for us cannot be foiled by anything, not even our rejection of God. My first church at a seminary was Second Presbyterian in Concord, North Carolina. It was a small church, and we had this small group of seniors we called the prime timers. Every month, we'd have some kind of program, a speaker, a craft, a field trip. And the day usually ended with lunch. And in between the program and lunch, we had this little time we called it our prayer time. We did it down in the fellowship hall. We all gathered in metal chairs near the stage and Janie Goodnight, our church organist, played hymns on the always out of tune upright piano. The prime timers didn't care. Some of them just couldn't hear the sharp and flat notes and others were more concerned about their hymn choice. I'd open with a prayer and a scripture, and then they would call out their hymn by name or number. And as long as Janie knew it, and she usually did, she'd start playing it, usually up-tempo, and we'd sing a few verses and then go on to the next hymn. One of our prime timers was a kind, quiet woman named Miss Cleo. She was in her 80s, a widow with no children. She'd grown up in the mountains of North Carolina and moved to Concord as a young woman to work in the cotton mills. She only lived a few blocks from the church, which was down the street from the now defunct mill. Miss Cleo was a worrier. She worried about everything. She worried about the little things like the flowers in her yard, and she worried about the big things like her relationship with God. But she had a very, very firm Christian faith, and still she worried. 
when the prime timer sang, Miss Cleo always requested the same hymn, month by month, year by year. We came to know it by heart. It's hymn number 833 in our current hymnal. We're going to sing it after the sermon. A love that wilt not let me go. I learned Miss Cleo needed to hear that message. She needed to hear it again and again and again. Oh, love that wilt not let me go. I told her on more than one occasion, she didn't need to worry. I told her that nobody, not anything, not her doubts, her failings, nothing could ever snatch her from the arms of her shepherd. She knew it, but she just needed to hear it sung over and over and over again. I have times like that, don't you? I wish I could have told Miss Cleo a story I learned years later after she died. I've told this story before because good ones are worth repeating. It was first told by the Reverend Dr. Will Willimon, who's now a retired United, United Methodist bishop and pastor. It's a story about one of the members of his congregation. They were having coffee one day and he asked her, so how you been? How's your fall been going? The woman said, well, not so good. Our son has been putting us through hell. He said, I'm sorry, how old is your son? She said, he's 18 and we haven't known where he is for the past six months. We basically had to change the locks on the door. I pray for him every night, but we still didn't know where he was. Last week, suddenly during dinner, someone is pounding on the front door and we open the door and it's him. He starts this string of profanities. I said, we're eating, come in, sit down and eat with us. But he refuses to sit at the table. He storms back into his room. He slams the door and I hear the door lock. My husband sat there. Then he got up, poured himself a drink and turned on the TV. That's how he handles it. I put my napkin down and got up and went down the hall. I went out to the garage and looked at my my husband's tools. And I got this big hammer, this very large hammer. And I walked back from the garage and down the hall and stood in front of my son's door. I asked him, open the door, please. And out came this string of profanities. So I took that hammer and I leaned back and hit it with one good hit. And I knocked the whole doorknob, the lock, everything right off the door, split the door in two. And then I barged through that door and my son looked terrified. And I caught him right up under his chin and I slammed him against the headboard of the bed. And I said to him, I went into labor because of you. And by God, I will never, ever, ever give up on you. Amplify that woman, that mother's passionate appeal a thousandfold, and you have something close to the relenting love of God. It's a love that in that ancient word of Miss Cleo's favorite hymn, will not let you go. Not now, not ever, never. Amen.